So it took forensic psychiatry, ballistics, of a president next on a special 2020. And now, ABC's 2020. Tonight on 2020, USA! USA! the story behind the bombshell election that the whole world watched and the man in the middle of it all. You know, people say he's off prompter. Bing, bing, bong, and that. Give me a break, he's Donald Trump. The surprise candidate who brought us to this historic divide. Not my president! Not my president! But should people be afraid that revenge is one of his motivators? Exclusive insider secrets from Trump's off-limits war room, from his fiercest defender on the front lines. Everything we did was mocked. Yeah. Pick a card, any card. All new revelations from his inner circle. You don't want to mess with Eric. You don't want to mess with Ivanka. And you certainly don't want to mess with Don Jr. They're killers. His daughter-in-law, was he serious about running? We're all taking bets. Like, who actually thinks he's going to go out and do this? And why some critics claim he wanted to run. You're essentially saying the campaign hasn't been to make America great again. It's been to make Trump great again. Tonight, an insider's view like never before. I'm ABC correspondent Tom Yamas, and for the past 500 days, I've covered Donald Trump's campaign. The good, the bad, on camera and off script. Your critics say you tend to exaggerate, you have a problem with the truth, and sometimes even this pointed right at me. Sleazy guy right over here from ABC. Why, why am I sleazy? You're sleazy. Now, Trump's wild, rule-breaking ride. No sidetracks, Donald. Nice and easy. From the penthouse to the White House. Donald Trump, the making of a president. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Muir. Tonight, millions of Americans, of course, are still talking about it, election night in America, still feeling it. It is a triumph for millions who believe they have finally been heard. But there is also profound soul searching for millions as well, asking how did this happen? Hillary Clinton winning the popular vote, but what cannot be disputed, a decisive win in the electoral college for Donald Trump. And late this week, that moment, the president and the president-elect the first step on a long road toward healing. We are in unchartered political territory with tens of thousands of people taking to the streets to protest after one of the most divisive campaigns in our history. So what drives this man and how will it shape his presidency? Here's Tom Yamas. In 70 days, Donald Trump will have a new job. I very much look forward to dealing with the president. And a new home, trading three floors of his glittering Versailles-inspired penthouse for the slightly more staid corridors of the White House. I am looking around this room. The White House might be a step down. <laughs> the White House is the White House. It's just a, a spectacular place. and. You know, it's uh, something that represents something very special. Lara Trump is married to Donald's son, Eric. Will they totally redecorate the White House to look like Trump Tower? They have... <laughs> They'll make things how they like them. Comfortable, but, but very nice and well done and tasteful. They're not going to be knocking down any walls. So how did he get there? We're going to get to work immediately for the American people. Even his close friends, like billionaire real estate tycoon Richard LaFrac, never saw it coming. Well, I'm not surprised. I'm astonished. I'm more than surprised. But he gets the ball down the field. He's going to put it in the end zone and score a touchdown. That's the way he is. I love this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a story that begins about 15 miles away from his victory party 70 years ago in Jamaica Estates, a wealthy neighborhood in Queens, New York. You can't understand Donald without looking at his childhood. Donald J. Trump lived in this ornate home, the fourth of five children. He did not grow up as a middle-class kid. The family had chauffeurs. He was taken to school in a limousine. He never had to work regular jobs. He described his mother, Mary, a Scottish immigrant, as the perfect housewife. His father, Fred, was a millionaire real estate developer. The Trump patriarch has been described as a human machine, driven. His father was, you know, he was a demanding guy and he did very much push Donald and Donald in some ways was the chosen son. 
that ambition was unmistakably prevalent in young Donald's DNA. Donald, I think, was more than a troublemaker. He was a profound brat. He has said that, he, that he, he punched his teachers when he didn't like what he was being told to do. In need of discipline, young Donald was shipped off to New York Military Academy. Once he came under the control of the staff at the school, he wanted to excel. He had to be first at everything, even if it was just to get first in line at the cafeteria. <laughs> Just last year, Trump told ABC's Barbara Walters about his dreams at that time in his life. What was your fantasy when you were very young? To be a baseball player. I was a great baseball player. What position? First base, catcher, mm -hmm. first base. But in those days, you got paid $2, right? <laughs> and that's not for Donald Trump. I mean, no. But my other fantasy as I got older was to do uh, movies. I wanted to be a movie maker. Do you think his father had any role in him not pursuing that career in show business. I think there was no way Donald wasn't inevitably become, going to become a real estate developer. He's still fascinated by stardom. I think that was one of the things that stood out for me the most was this cinematic sense he has of himself. He identifies strongly with Orson Welles and Citizen Kane. Until a few weeks ago, I had no hope of being elected. <laughs> But at the end of the day, his father exerted a pretty inescapable pull on him to come back to the family business. He accompanied his father to sites all over New York's outer boroughs, where Fred Trump was building middle and low income housing. And I started off making little deals in Brooklyn and Queens with my father, and they seemed to work out. And then with a loan from dad, Donald Trump struck out on his own. I think the rules that Fred Trump taught his son Donald began with, you must be a winner. So this is a person who plays hard and wants to win. And if that means setting the rules himself, he'll set the rules himself and then try to get everyone else to play by them. Those rules would have devastating consequences for Donald's brother, Fred Jr. He drank heavily and died of heart failure at the age of 43. I think Fred would have been very happy if he didn't have to compete. He had to compete because of the environment. He had to compete. And it ultimately ended up destroying him. And it was very sad, very sad. And ultimately, it was alcohol that just decimated him. And I'm glad I'm not a drinker. I mean, I've never had a drink in my life. Younger brother Robert, who worked for Donald later in life, learned what older brother Donald was like at an early age. Robert had a set of blocks, and I had a set of blocks, and I asked Robert if I could have his blocks, and I built a beautiful, tall block building, and then I said I like it so much that I glued it together, and then Robert couldn't have his block. <laughs> so I don't know. Somehow that story is a story that a lot of people have asked me about. I don't know. <laughs> what do you think it says? Well, it says, I think, that just even at a young age, I wasn't so much different than I am now. I don't know. You had to get what you wanted, even if it was somebody else's blocks? Well, that's the old story, isn't it, huh? Richard LaFrac has been friends with Donald Trump for nearly half a century. He says the man he knows is not that different from the boy gluing his brother's confiscated blocks. The drive, the determination, this kind of boundless energy that he has, that's always been Donald. He loves to accomplish things. We have to get it finished and get it started. And he loves to be complimented for his achievements. Hello, Lynn Patton speaking. His longtime staffer, Lynn Patton, says the serial Twitter user is quite old fashioned, at least when it comes to technology. It took us a while to wean him from a flip phone to his smartphone. Mr. Trump uh, runs things his way and it certainly works for him. So, you know, they say don't fix it if it ain't broke. There is no such thing as an email from Donald Trump. That does not exist. Never seen him with a computer. But he does take the time to write very nice handwritten notes Donald never wants to curl up with a book. Donald likes activity, he likes people. What words would you use to describe Donald Trump? I've always had great imagination. I've had great success with money. I've actually gotten along well with people over the years. You have said that one of the most important aspects in your personality is winning. Why winning? What about the, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game? I like winning better. Look, <laughs> we have to win. Trump says another part of the formula for success is not revealing your weaknesses. What is your greatest fear? Well, I don't want to reveal fears because if I reveal fears, I'm giving up something. You know, we all have certain fears and everybody has fears, but I don't like revealing my fears. Being non-conventional is part of his playbook. My name's Donald Trump, and I'm the largest real estate developer in New York. Next, after extending his footprint on land, he conquered the air, 
television. You want to be in the presence of Donald J. Trump, you cannot be weak. You got to be mouth. tough and you got to be able to take it. You're fired. You're fired. You're all fired. All four are fired. Stay with us. Central on ABC. Before he was president-elect, Donald Trump was the king of the Big Apple. My name's Donald Trump, and I'm the largest real estate developer in New York. And 30 years ago, he bypassed the city's signature yellow taxis for this $10 million French Air Les Special helicopter. He took Barbara Walters for a ride. What do you feel like when you look at that wonderful skyline? Well, I look at that skyline, Barbara, and I really say it's the greatest in the world. I'd really like to buy everything if that were possible. <laughs> a real estate tycoon overlooking his empire, salivating at the possibilities. Nothing seemed too sacred, almost. And what about Central Park? Now, I think Donald Trump should not be allowed to touch Central Park. He's a man with few limits, never following the real estate rules. He shocked many when he negotiated a 40-year tax abatement for this hotel. People would say, how did you get 40 years? I said, because I didn't ask for 50. That was the, it was so easy. But then he erected what's now become a monument of sorts, the first building to bear his name, Trump Tower. Many call it his greatest triumph. Trump calls it home. For now, a 30,000 square foot penthouse, three levels of over-the-top decor, dripping in gold, a fountain in the living room, and ceilings painted with scenes from Greek mythology. The tile on the bathroom floor, he said, had come uh, from a mine somewhere in deepest, darkest Africa. Soon, those signature buildings began popping up all over the Big Apple, and later, across the country. Now there's even one in Istanbul, all brandishing his name, Trump. Though now, because of the things he said during his campaign, some residents of buildings that bear his name won out. That man we have found does not represent our values. Some, like broadcaster Keith Oberman, sold and moved away. I couldn't go under the sign anymore that said Trump Palace without spitting because I just, it's, and I ran out of spit. So what do you think the Trump brand stands for? The epitome of luxury. If I asked you to name another condo builder, you couldn't do it. Donald Trump went all in on Atlantic City, opening several casinos, a huge gamble. Did you know anything about the gaming industry? I knew the numbers, I knew the economics. And the numbers were staggering. By the late 80s, he says his three casinos were making $15 million a week. Trump hit the jackpot by luring celebrities to the gambling mecca. Chief among them, Michael Jackson. Mike Tyson, and Hulk Hogan. Thank God Donald Trump's a Hulkamaniac! That relentless desire to win made his name a modern synonym for success and celebrity in his own right. Authoring best-selling books, making cameos in movies. Excuse me, where's the lobby? Down the hall and to the left. On television. Look, I'll tell you what, throw in another 50 grand, I'll cut the grass for you every Saturday. <laughs> Even commercials. We eat our pizza the wrong way. Crust first. If flaunting it was the game, Trump was the name. My new game is Trump the game. Because it's not whether you win or lose, it's whether you win. He continued to win not only by being a businessman, but as being a business himself. The name Trump is such a brand for success that it has been licensed on an astonishing range of products. Trump model management. What does this guy not have his name on? The reason my real estate is successful is they know if I put the name Trump on it, it's going to be the best. But in the 90s, his fiery mix of hubris and vision caused him to win and lose fortunes. When a casino analyst made this prediction about the Trump Taj Mahal... When uh, December and January roll around, you could see business drop off 30 or 40 percent. He learned firsthand what kind of trouble challenging Trump's numbers can get you. Trump threatened to sue, and the analyst was fired. Are you going to fight it to the bitter end? I always fight to the bitter end, don't I? In the end, he was forced to fold the Trump Taj Mahal casino, resulting in job losses. And his commercial airline, Trump Shuttle, grounded. I was at the highest of all pedestals, the hottest in the country. Everything I touched turned to gold. And then one day, the pedestal was knocked out from under me. Midas had lost his touch. Donald Trump's businesses filed for bankruptcy twice. 
He explained his financial woes to us in 1994. I had billions of dollars of debt, in excess of five billion. I had $975 million worth of personal debt. Despite the losses and two more corporate bankruptcies, Trump continued to promote a picture of profits and power. I fought back and I won. Now my company's bigger than it ever was. It's stronger than it ever was. Tim O'Brien, who wrote a biography on Trump, says his specialty wasn't building, but branding. What he essentially has been is a robust branding and marketing operation and an incredible self-promoter. He's essentially a human shingle. What do you want? Well, that's always a question I hate to answer because it's like, who I cares? I know, but I love but to. I care. I really care. care. Forbes magazine says I'm worth a lot. Would I say that I'm worth $5 billion? $5 I would, billion. I would say I'm worth more than $5 billion, but it's irrelevant. That year, Forbes estimated his worth at only $2.5 billion. But the actual number, the American public has no idea. Remember, he refused to release his tax returns. So you've got to ask yourself, why won't he release his tax returns? Maybe he's not as rich as he says he is. But back in 2004, Donald Trump took another risk, something few celebrities of his caliber had ever tried. A reality TV show about himself and the cutthroat business world, The Search for His Apprentice. I'm here to see Donald Trump. The risk paid huge dividends. 20 million people watched him grill young Trump wannabes in the boardroom every week. I didn't come here to make friends. Omarosa Manigault, now a senior advisor to the Donald Trump campaign, was a contestant on the show. What was your first impression the first time you saw him up close? So the first time Donald walked into the boardroom, he took one of those infamous Donald Trump breaths, like, Hello, everybody. Okay, folks. You know? <laughs> I literally almost laughed because it was like, it was like a caricature yeah. of the person. Then you realize that's the way he is. He goes, you, what's your story? He doesn't ease into it. He was just immediately. Yeah, don't waste time. And if you did or screwed up, you heard that infamous phrase. You're fired. When we come back, we go from the boardroom to the bedroom. Donald Trump's private life. The father, the husband, the playboy. Look this way, Lisa. Next. Tuesday, 10, 9 central on ABC. In the early 90s, Donald Trump is on the hunt for three things, power, money, and women. An easy way to understand Donald Trump is that his appetites are whetted and heightened by, by the chase. He certainly is drawn to very beautiful women. He surrounds himself with beautiful women, and many of them are very intelligent. Wife Ivana Trump is one of those beautiful and intelligent women. She's just not the only one. The couple's 14-year marriage is on the rocks after whispers of an affair with Marla Maples, a woman the tabloids have dubbed the Georgia Peach. Wife Ivana, who has three kids with Donald, tells ABC's Primetime she never saw it coming. Did you see warning signs? Uh, I really didn't. I didn't. Are you following the Trump thing? You can't miss it. The latest is fast from the front in the battle of Trump versus Trump. The front page fiasco of lovers, lawyers, and large settlements. In the end, Ivana gets more than 20 million in a divorce settlement in 1992. A year later, Donald weds Maples, a former beauty queen. But for Donald Trump, one beauty queen simply won't do. So in 1996, he buys them all. Can you stand it? Purchasing the Miss Universe pageant and putting Marla front and center as the new co-host. If for any reason Miss Universe cannot complete her reign, the first runner-up will become Miss Universe. But soon, it's Marla Maple's universe that's about to change. Her marriage to the Donald is now in trouble. I give it four months. Actually, the relationship lasts just under four years. Here's Marla leaving divorce court, a little wealthier and a lot wiser. You just got away. <laughs> this way, Lisa. Playboy Donald is back playing the field and wants everyone to know about it. He even has a publicist named John Miller, a guy who sounds a lot like Trump himself. Take a listen. I think you're doing tremendously well financially. Trump denies the voice is his. Reporters are left amused and or confused. But in the world of Trump, any news is good news. He's an incredible self-promoter and marketer. In 1998, Donald finally meets his match at a party in New York City. 
a model from Slovenia named Melania, who told Barbara Walters she played hard to get. What's your first impression of Donald Trump? Well, he was very charming, and uh, he, we had a great sparkle. Uh, he came with a date, so he asked me for the number, and I said, I will not give you my number. So if you give me your numbers, I will, um, I will call you. And he was known as kind of a ladies' man, and, uh, but we had... <laughs> The two marry in 2005. Donald is a generation older than his model bride. Your husband has been married twice before. Did you have any concerns that it might not work out? No, I didn't have any concerns. Uh, we have a great chemistry. And to be with the man as my husband is, uh, you need to know who you are. You need to have a very independent life as well and supporting him. You need to be very smart and quick and be there for him when he needs you. That's the big difference in this marriage. I think that she appears to be very focused on his needs, on being Mrs. Donald Trump, and she's not focused on getting anything for herself. After a year, they have a son, Baron, now 10 years old, who Melania refers to as Little Donald. Father and son share a love of golf. That's Baron taking a practice swing inside the family's marble living room. When he comes home, we spend time together, two of us, or two of us and Baron. Just be at home, because that's a really quality time together. Quality time for Trump's older kids, Donald Jr., Ivanka, Eric, and Tiffany, was not always at home. Your father has said that he was not, I'm using his words, very present when you were growing up. I would challenge him on that yeah. because he was very available to us and accessible to us. If we called, he took the phone. I mean, oh, from when we were six okay. years old, I'd call, he'd be negotiating with the CEO of a major bank or whatever it may be, <laughs> and he would make them wait. He'd take the call from us. Our times together were learning, you know, playing in his office. He would always sneak me down to uh, get a candy bar, you know, in the lobby. Does it take time for him to kind of mold into that into that role, or is it just different? He's more old-fashioned. How would you describe it? Instead of going out in the backyard and throwing around a football with them, they would come down to his office and be playing with Legos and, you know, toys there in his office while he's doing business deals. He found a way that was true to him to connect with us that maybe is a little less traditional. You know, his work is his passion and he found a way to share it with us. They say their father also taught them to respect the value of a dollar. To say we weren't spoiled would be laughable, but we were spoiled with great education, great experiences, but we weren't the kids yeah. showing up to college with, you know, a, a Ferrari. We always had to sort of earn whatever it is that we wanted. And it seems the Donald Trump work ethic is genetic. I think we all have a very competitive spirit, and I think that can be harnessed in one of two ways. F to our detriment, meaning that we're competitive in spite of ourselves, or for the positive, which means we push each other. Ivanka, swing Ivanka is perhaps the most well-known of the group, and quite possibly, daddy's favorite. You better do a good job or you're fired. <laughs> Who is his favorite? I'm going with Ivanka. <laughs> <laughs> Today, three Trump children work as executive vice presidents at the family business, trying to keep pace with their dad. Sometimes I'll tell him, like, oh, you have to, you know, slow down, but it's the only speed he knows, and I, and I kind of love that about him. Tiffany, Trump's daughter by his second wife, Marla Maples, recently graduated from her father's alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania. I think that it's all I know. I'm ha so happy to be Tiffany Trump. I'm so happy to be, you know, in the family I'm in with my siblings and my father and my mother. Hello, Trump's eight grandchildren are also being groomed for the family business. Look at this, huh? What a troop. What is your father like as a grandfather? Uh, he, he's been great. <laughs> Everyone having a good time? I can see my kids just running up to him and giving a hug. They just respect him a lot. Those grandchildren have an unlikely uncle in 10-year-old Baron. The boss right here, look at him with all Who's these. That? How did you keep all these kids in line, uh, Baron? We joke, you have to really respect your uncle, even though there's a one-year <laughs> difference. Uh, so that, that drives my kids crazy. Bye, Grandma, Bye, love everybody. you. Bye, Spencer. Bye. But will this family become the first family? How a simple joke may have pushed Donald Trump towards the presidency. And we were all taking bets, like who actually thinks he's gonna go out and do this? When we return.
going on now, only at Ashley Home Store. This is home. Anybody with any modicum of ego would probably like to be president of the United States. New York developer Donald Trump. But I certainly don't see that in the cards. Is he running for something? I have zero political aspiration. Donald Trump spends decades in the public eye professing his ambition is aimed at wealth, not the Commonwealth. No, no, no. High office buildings, not high office. I love what I do. And I, I really believe I do it better than anyone else. But if I can point out the deficiencies in the way our system is going, if I can point out certain stupidities, I've done a great service to the country. That service included perpetuating a false race-baiting conspiracy theory that the nation's first black president wasn't born in America and therefore not entitled to hold office. If he wasn't born in this country, which is a real possibility, then he has pulled one of the great cons in the history of politics. Which in turn triggers what some say is the Trump U-turn from Park Avenue to Pennsylvania Avenue and a path to the White House. It comes five years ago. I was invited by a lot of people. Citizen Trump, so you come here, birther you're and billionaire, you're gonna... sitting in the audience of the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Donald Trump. <laughs> Here tonight. The future president-elect is just a punchline. No one is prouder to put this birth certificate matter to rest than the Donald. And that's because he can finally get back to focusing on the issues that matter. Like, did we fake the moon landing? He wasn't laughing. No, I mean, he was like a couple tables over from me and I kept looking to check and he didn't crack a smile. Do you think that he was so thin-skinned he could be motivated to seek the highest office in this country just because he was the butt of a bunch of jokes? Absolutely. I think he's also so unaware of his own limitations as a person that he didn't find the prospect of doing that daunting. What's your greatest weakness? Well, I don't love criticism. I don't love uh, unfair criticism. He certainly would bring some change to the White Did House. Did that moment of public ridicule ignite an age-old instinct for personal payback? No. Trump told Barbara Walters it wasn't personal. It was strictly business. You look at what's going on with our trade deals, which are so horrendous and so one-sided. You look at what's going on with jobs. It begins with this moment, June 16th. 2015, a showman's grand entrance, descending as if from the clouds down the escalator at Trump Tower in New York. And we were all taking bets, like who actually thinks he's gonna go out and do this? Daughter Ivanka launching a campaign that was to become very much a family affair. Today, I have the honor of introducing a man who needs no introduction. I am officially running for President of the United States, Trump's daughter-in-law, Lara. There were so many people, especially at the beginning of uh, his campaign, that didn't take him seriously. Didn't think he had a shot to win, but that didn't stop him. The maverick outsider, true to form, breaking all the rules of civic discourse, for one thing. Because our leaders are stupid. Stupid, stupid people. Wah. Bing, bing, bong, and dad. The primary colors run red as Trump unleashes a stone-cold style of smackdown so wrong. Backyard, no rules wrestling. Let me just hiding say, in the excuse me. Somebody say Uncle Debate. Two hours so we can get the hell out of here, not bad. <laughs> Applying his businessman's brandy genius to label his opponents indelibly with those now famous nicknames. Don't worry about it, little Marco. I've given my answer, Lion Ted. Jeb Bush is a low energy person. Crooked Hillary Clinton. Bad-mouthing politicians was one thing, but Trump has that one step beyond quality that led him to badmouth entire swaths of the population as well. When Mexico sends its people, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh, I don't remember. Omarosa Manigault is a senior advisor who worked on African-American outreach during the campaign. Has being so close to Donald Trump affected any of your personal relationships with friends or family? There are people who stop talking to me, and I will never forget the people who turned their backs on me 
when all I was trying to do was help the black community. <laughs> it's been so incredibly hard. Has your father ever said anything on the campaign trail that made you cringe? Truthfully, no. He's not a big believer in PC culture where every statement you make, you have to vet very carefully through thousands of people. He speaks in a way that the average person can understand. I think that's refreshing for everyone. The billionaire in his tailored suits and private aircraft resonating with the working class. You know, he's not a snob, Donald. Even though he's a successful, super wealthy guy, uh, he's more of a man of the people than most people think. This picture, tweeted out by Trump himself, says it all on his plane and enjoying a bucket of KFC chicken. Although he's extremely wealthy, he likes very simple things. Uh, this entire campaign, I've had more fast food than I've ever consumed in my entire life. Now, my friends! While the Clinton campaign tested 85 different slogans, Trump's was a crystal clear distillation of both anger and aspiration. What I want to do is make America great again. Very simple. As the campaign wore on, it became clear that Trump's renegade style you have to build the wall. wasn't just an act, it was a strategy. Lack of political experience, that's a plus, not a minus. And politicians, they're all talk, they're no action. 30-second ads, who needs them when you can use Twitter? Good press, fine. Bad press, better. Just attack the media. Say like this sleazy guy right over here from ABC. He's a sleaze, my why, book. Why am I sleaze? You're a sleaze because you know, you know the facts and you know the facts can well. Go ahead. Donald primary season becomes a traveling circus for Trump and a death march for his rivals. Tonight, Donald Trump, the only Republican left standing. When we come back, a coronation in Cleveland. But the Trump campaign is about to get hit by a bus. There is no difference. No, really, that's it. That's how I save at Publix. How about you? Publix, where shopping is a pleasure. Expecting understated, maybe? Forget about it. This is the Donald, after all, making his grand appearance at the Republican National Convention. He once told me that when he was in front of all these crowds, he felt like a rock star without a guitar. The conventions highlighted a curious contradiction for Trump. Despite his lifelong cultivation of his celebrity status, his convention was notably bereft of Hollywood high wattage. Scott Bayo is what passed for star power. He basically said, I don't need A-list stars, I'm the A-list star, and that's good enough. Ironically, while the Democratic convention did have an endless parade of stars, it was a complete unknown who made the most impact, the Muslim father of a slain U.S. serviceman. You have sacrificed nothing. That criticism brought into play that key Trump trait. No slight is too small. No one is above or below attack even a gold star father. Well, that sounds, uh, who wrote that? Did uh, Hillary's uh, script writers write it? He counterpunches twice as hard. Why does he do that? He has this Darwinian sense of himself that only the hungriest and fiercest animal survives. On the eve of the first presidential debate, Trump was bucking orthodoxy again. Compared to the days Clinton spent studying and practicing, he preferred to spend much of his time on the campaign trail where he had often been bombastic. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. Listen, he ran a completely unconventional campaign. He didn't follow any of the norms. He did it his way. The improvisational style with its pluses and perils on full display at the first presidential debate. For the first 30 minutes, Trump is on his best behavior, sticking to his talking points. We have to renegotiate our trade deals. But as Hillary's constant barbs sink in. So a man who can be provoked by a tweet should not have his fingers anywhere near the nuclear codes. Trump reverts to form before our very eyes. Donald supported the invasion of Iraq. Wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Then came the huge October surprise, the Axis Hollywood footage of Trump with correspondent Billy Bush. Grab him by the <laughs> I can do any of that. Trump's seemingly cavalier attitude about forcing himself on women ignited a firestorm of outrage. Less than a week later, there are new accusations. A campaign under siege. A new allegation of sexual misconduct against Donald Trump. The man whose children laud him as a family man suddenly under the microscope for allegations of sexual misconduct. It wasn't the father-in-law that I knew. It wasn't the man that I knew. 
And once again, the winner take all. Trump hangs tough, even while fellow Republicans are calling for him to quit. So you just have to hunger down and focus and know that what you're doing is you're doing right by the people. A scandal that might derail any other campaign instead prompts Trump to charge forward. Every woman lied. Total fabrication. All of these liars will be sued after the election is over. I never, ever quit. I never give up. And in one way, that can be a little aggravating to people. In another way, I think it's a good trade. But despite Trump's my way or the highway reputation, there are signs during his campaign that he is willing to adapt and change. I was actually pleasantly surprised by how many times he did ask me for my opinion, how many times he asks his other senior staff for their opinion. Trump's advisors fight to keep him on message, reportedly preventing him from tweeting. And finally, making sure he stays disciplined at his campaign rallies. Just listen to what sounds like an inner monologue. We've got to be nice and cool, nice and cool. No sidetracks, Donald, nice and easy, nice. With days to go until the election, Trump is exuding confidence on the stump. And we are going to win the White House. Going to win it. And we will make America great again. But privately, his longtime friend says he had a more realistic view of the outcome. You know, he didn't say to me, no, this is not going to happen for me. He just said, look, I'm competing every place, and I'm hopeful for the best. The morning of the election, Trump is booed at his polling place. And the internet has a good laugh when he sneaks a peek at Melania's ballot. With polls and pundits uniformly predicting a Trump defeat, the Clinton campaign is sipping champagne on their plane. Their candidate even signing a Newsweek magazine Madam President cover. A big state for Donald Trump. Donald but then Trump state after the state, state starts Ohio. falling Trump to Trump. I heard there was a moment where people started coming up to him saying, President Trump, and he was like, hold on, not till we know for sure. Well, he's confident, but he's not an arrogant person, and he's becoming the president of the United States is a very humbling experience for anyone. He is now going to be the 45th president of the United States. Trump had seen something none of the politicians and pundits had seen, and at last, stunning victory in hand, he showed a side he's rarely shown, a capacity for graciousness. We can work together and unify our great country. Coming up, Mr. Trump goes to Washington. He may now be president-elect, but will he be presidential? Happening now, a third. $398. Save money, live better. Walmart. This is one of the most beautiful buildings in New York City, if not the world. Kellyanne Conway, just today, showing me the balcony at Trump Tower. As we chat, get that look. Cheers break out across the way. They're happy. Maybe they think you're Mike Pence. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's been plenty of celebrating all around Trump's red cap nation. Millions of Americans voicing their excitement this week that the newest Trump residence in Washington will be 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. But thousands of others have taken to the streets across the country in protest for three days in a row this week. You are under arrest. As the nation struggles to heal, how will the persona of Donald Trump, the candidate, transition to Donald Trump, the president? Do you think he's going to move forward with any of his plans? I mean, he's got a lot of big, bold ideas. But remember, this is, this is a guy who doesn't come with any kind of a, a, a sense of policy making. So I think what you'll see, I think he'll hand off a lot of the domestic policy to the Hill and uh, a lot of the foreign policy making to his advisors. Yesterday, Trump himself listed his priorities on Capitol Hill. We're gonna look very strongly at immigration, we're gonna look at border, we're gonna look at healthcare, and we're looking at jobs, big league jobs. I know he's going to do such an incredible job. And I actually think the people who were against him the entire time, who probably are still upset that he's president, are going to be the ones that come around and see what a great job he does. And I actually think a lot of those people are going to vote for him for a second term. But what will a Trump White House really look like? So much is still unknown, and the clock is ticking. We've got a great transition effort, and yeah. now Governor, well, Vice President-elect yeah. Mike Pence is the chairman of that effort. Kellyanne Conway revealed to me that Mike Pence has taken over the transition from Chris Christie. But as for other clues to the inner workings, 
she wouldn't reveal much. But you were fired up tonight, right? I was fired up. You better believe it. This man, whom I've followed for more than 500 days on the campaign trail, prides himself on his big ideas, but often leaves the small details to others and trusting only a small group of his proven allies. People who know Trump well predict exciting times ahead. So a Donald Trump presidency will be? Unprecedented and incredible. Very, very unpredictable. Selling the air rights over the White House. You know, people should get to know the man behind the movement. It's only week one, and what a week. You Countdown is now on 70 days until inauguration, and we'll be reporting on it every step of the way. We're sure you have many thoughts after tonight's program, so keep the conversation going with us here on Facebook and Twitter. Use the hashtag ABC2020. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Mueller. From all of us here at 2020 and ABC News, have a great weekend. Good night. David Blaine, Beyond Magic, Tuesday, 10, 9 central on